Tonight, meet Lucy, the teenage transsexual who's turning 18 at 10.40. Now, though, justice is served on BBC One, thanks to you. Tonight on Crime Watch Solved. Killing by numbers. How your calls helped catch a murderer obsessed with witchcraft and secret codes. The bank robbery that turned out to be an inside job. And the 22-year hunt for the Salisbury sex attacker. I'm apologising, sister. I am sorry for what he done to you. Incredible cases that you helped solve. Salisbury in the mid-80s had a problem. <laughs> a violent serial sex attacker was on the loose. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Keep your voice down. His name? Christopher Downs. A man obsessed with violence, control and sex. I think we were slightly naive and thought it was going to be easy and that the clues would be there. But as the months went on, we actually realised that it was a bit of a needle in a haystack. It would take 22 years before police caught up with him. In the case of Christopher Downs, you had someone who was incredibly controlling and dominant over his victims, presence of a weapon, someone that was really instilling fear in their victim. <laughs> it all began in November 1984 with a robbery. I was asleep on the sofa because I was heavily pregnant with my son and I was woken by somebody holding what was a Stanley knife or some sort of knife against my throat. <laughs> you move and you're dead. When he first woke me up, it was thought, what's going on? You know, and your stomach churns, you think, hang on a minute, this is reality here. This is not, you're not dreaming, you are awake. It's not who you think it is. How much do you want? Can I tell us how much you got? Well, I've got my daughter's bike money was going to buy her a bike for Christmas. Uh -huh. I really wasn't scared right at that particular time, but afterwards I was terrified. I couldn't even stand up, my legs went to jelly. But I didn't know how else to react. I think if I'd have panicked and screamed or whatever, he'd, he, then he might have got really violent. Well, go on then. Get out! The ordeal over, she fled to her neighbours for help. I mean, no doubt that her feisty approach saved her from far worse. Christopher Downs was not expecting that type of behaviour when he walked through the door, and I'm sure he had different intentions, and it wasn't just to steal. The following month, Downs struck again, this time the nurses' quarters at the old manor hospital. Where's your money? What are you doing? What, what I is, said, where's your it? money? It's in my bag. In my purse there. How did you get in here? Monkey jumped the window. Two decades later, that phrase, I monkey jumped the window, would be a clue that Crime Watch viewers helped unravel. Here. I've got two pounds. Is that all you've got? I know it's not. Oh. Hey, no, go make a noise. Don't make a noise. Shut up! That nurse was held at knife point and then forced to perform oral sex on Christopher Downs. Following that, she was then forced to masturbate him until he ejaculated into a tissue. He won't see me again. <laughs> Chris
Christopher Downs left two vital clues at this crime scene. He discarded a length of blue rope and left his semen in a tissue. However, in 1984, he didn't need to be forensically aware, as DNA profiling had not been discovered. That rope was distinctive. It was made exclusively for British Telecom. But police were snowed under at the time, and this line of inquiry wasn't followed up. He must have had a side to him that none of us knew about whatsoever, because I've never, ever, in my 50 years, seen him like that. Never. Downs was born on the 27th of May, 1952, in Porton, near Salisbury. He was the third of seven children. We were a loving family, a close family. My mother and father looked after us, cared for us and loved us. And we was all close as youngsters. And it was all loving, playing. We used to go to pictures together. As a child, he seemed to be happy and playful and caring. He was very caring. They always used to look out for me, because I was the baby. Aged just 10, he was convicted of stealing at Salisbury Juvenile Court, for which he was given three years probation. It didn't prove a deterrent. Downs went on to commit a string of minor offences and was in and out of prison throughout the 70s. He was a loner. He was a loner. Had a couple of friends, but he was a loner. He used to pinch cars quite a lot, I remember. <laughs> he had a fascination with cars. When you look back at the criminal history of Christopher Downs, it ticks all the boxes. There are no great surprises in terms of a, a, a typical sex offender. We would expect people that behave in the way that Christopher Downs did in these offences to get engaged with criminality at a fairly early age. Downs couldn't stop himself. He was becoming more and more violent, and weeks after the second attack, he struck again. Shut up, shut up, shut up. <laughs> Give me that round. <laughs> <laughs> By the third offence, suddenly you have some very threatening, sadistic behaviour. So a, a, a pretty rapid escalation over a period of no more than uh, a couple of months. Salisbury faced a crisis. A serial sex attacker was on the loose. I would certainly like to speak to this man very, very soon, and very soon indeed. That is why we're appealing to as many members of the public as we can. Just need to put a little bit of ink on the pad, first of all. Policing methods back then were primitive. They relied on witnesses and confessions to get results. There was certainly no DNA. They relied on fingerprints and bloodstains. Christopher Downs wore gloves, and there were no witnesses other than his victims. Consequently, the investigation soon hit a brick wall. One of the principal problems was that it grew too big too soon. They had around 1,500 men named or involved in their inquiries back in 1984-85. And what they really needed was some way to decode who the offender was. One anonymous call to police gave the name they were after. Yo, Jones. Chris Downs. Is that Downs Manee? Detectives were so close at the time, they just didn't know it. Back then, it was just another name in a very long list. They didn't have the techniques and the facilities available that we have today to close in on him and prove unequivocally that he was our offender. Had DNA testing been invented in 1985, he may well have been caught then. Only months after the third attack, he was arrested for stealing a vehicle. No link was made with the sex attacks, and he escaped with a £300 fine. 
By the time detectives reached Christopher Down's name on their list, the investigation was fast running out of steam. Officers visited Christopher Downs on a Friday afternoon. However, fortunately for him, he was not in. By the Monday morning, the investigation had been wound down and Christopher Downs was never seen. He had escaped capture by the skin of his teeth. Police now know more about what Downs was up to on the day of the third sex attack. Within hours of leaving his victim, he made initial contact with Christine March. They met via a dating agency, and by the end of the following year, they were married. They were very much in love. Very, very much in love. Like any couple, I think they had their ups and downs, but they stuck by one another, whatever. So if that's not love, what is? <laughs> In 1990, on the south coast, Christopher Downs attacked another woman. This was a particularly vicious attack involving a carving knife. I was stood on a corner of a straight and I took some cigarettes out from my bag and I didn't have a light. You looking for a light, love? Yeah, I am, actually. How you doing? There you go. You after business? Yeah, jump in. Come on in. He's a very calm sort of person, spoke very quietly. He seemed such a kind person. Nice boots. Oh. Let's get one thing straight. I'm not paying for any of this. All right, all right. You can have what you want, just put it away. No, 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 I don't think you understand. I don't understand perfectly well. Just put the knife away. Just shut your mouth. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> Keep your voice down. <laughs> shut up. It's for my life that I was fighting for now. <laughs> ah, <bitch. laughs> I don't think I've ever been so shocked in my whole life from somebody to go from one extreme to another so quickly. From being a nice, kind, what I thought was a nice, kind bloke, to a monster. He was like a monster. And you could see in his eyes, he it was, it was evil. Like two totally different people. Downs was caught and found guilty of attempted rape. He was sentenced to four years in prison. Still no connection was made with the previous three attacks. Christopher Downs was a prolific writer whilst in prison. I, my sexy lady, oh, my darling Chrissy, I love you so very, very much, with all my heart. Oh, baby, I'm missing you so much. I have read every single one of those letters that he sent to Christine, and it reveals a dark and disturbing side to his character. Oh, my baby, just you wait until I get you home. I'm going to rape you time and time again. Would you think you'd like that? Would you like that, my love? And I'll tie you to the bed as well. Too right I will. And I'll do it all again, but more slowly. I think it's very interesting when you look at the content of the letters that are written some years after, and yet you can see direct parallels between the sorts of themes of power, um, the idea of controlling, of raping uh, even his own partner. Um, you know, the sadistic element to what we started to see emerging in the, in the start of 1985. In November 93, Downs was released from prison. It would be 13 years before police would reopen the files on the 80s sex attacks. We had the three offences from the mid-1980s, which were all linked with common factors, like the type of knife he had, the description of clothing, the language he used, and the distinctive rope that he left at the scene. The most important clue was the semen-stained tissue left at the scene in 1984. 22 years later, it provided a breakthrough, a full DNA profile. Potentially, we had the answer to who committed these crimes. But when they checked the profile on the National DNA database, they drew a blank. 
Sean and his team were back to the drawing board. The first job was to look at the 1,500 possible suspects from the original investigation. This was a mammoth undertaking, but I wanted to trace and eliminate each and every one of these individuals. After nine months, detectives had traced and eliminated just 35 men. Downs was still a long way down the list. It was time to call Crime Watch. <laughs> this twine used, this blue twine, you'd think you'd get it anywhere, but, but 22 years ago, it came from one particular place, didn't it? That was made specially for BT. How did you get in here? A monkey jumped the window. One of the appeal points featured on Crime Watch was a phrase used by our attacker when he said he monkey jumped the window. We found out tonight from the calls that we've had in that monkey jump is an expression that used by BT engineers, so that has dramatically narrowed the focus of the inquiry. For the first time in 22 years, I had a direct link between the BT rope used at the scene and the phrase used by the suspect. From this, there was a strong possibility that our man had worked for British Telecom. Christopher Downs had worked as a subcontractor for BT. He'd laid cables for a new switchboard at the hospital where the third attack had taken place. And that wasn't all. Callers to Crime Watch gave me 33 names, one of which was Christopher Downs. Detectives went to see Downs. They needed the final piece of the jigsaw, a sample of his DNA. Is Christopher in? Yeah, hold on. Chris, please! Hello, hello, Mr. Downs. The house was a complete shrine to each other. There are numerous photos all over the wall of weddings, holidays, etc. Mr. Downs wasn't particularly surprised to see me. At least that's the impression I got. He was quite relaxed in our company. Okay. Okay, Mr. Downs, I'm going to take a mouse swab. All I'm going to do is scrape the inside of your cheek. Is that okay? He kept asking his wife whether it was the right thing to do to give a sample and she would appear to me to be the dominant one and said, yes, we've discussed this. He asked the usual questions, when would the results be in, what would happen with the results? And again, we just said, you know what the results are and uh, we'll let you know when, when they're in. After 22 years, police now had the DNA sample from the man they'd been looking for. The net was tightening. Downs knew the game was up and went to visit his boss. Chris came into work on the Wednesday and he asked us if um, he could have a few days off. He said it was actually for his mum's funeral. We authorised the request and um, we were then hoping to see him the following week. On the 9th of October, Christopher Downs and his wife Christine drove to a local beauty spot. Using a vacuum hose attached to the car exhaust, they committed suicide. This was a tragic outcome. Science had proved that we had our man, and I guess Christopher Downs knew this. And I was the one that had to break it to my mum that him and Christine had killed themselves. I didn't think they would do anything like that at all. I'd seen them the Saturday before, and they were so normal. If only had they spoken to me. The couple had written several suicide notes, which go some way towards explaining why they took their own lives. The light has finally gone out at the end of our tunnel, and this police inquiry was the final straw. We wanted to go together. Please don't be angry with me or Chris. We knew exactly what we were doing. It was really great spending our last month's wages on things that we wanted. Meals out, Chinese takeaways, shopping at Tesco's for all the treats we couldn't have afforded on our normal budget. I know Chris was innocent last time and ended up inside. And we can see the whole thing happening again. We will not let it happen again. Love to all of you, Christine. Love you all, Chris. Downs made no apology to his victims in the letters. He didn't even admit he was guilty. I think my brother's a coward for doing what he did, instead of standing up and taking the consequences for it. 
It's always sad when you hear somebody die generally. But not with him, I was so happy. It was such a relief, I started to cry, you know, to think that nobody ever, ever will suffer from him again. I'm apologising, not Chris. I'm apologising his sister. I am sorry for what he done to you. And I do sympathise, I do really sympathise. What my brother did, I personally am breaking up inside. And I don't know how to get over it. And I don't know whether I will. Had he been alive today, Christopher Downs would have been charged with rape, attempted rape, aggravated burglary, false imprisonment, and a string of indecent assaults. And I have to say, we couldn't have got there without the help of Crime Watch. And for me, his case closed. Still to come, how Crime Watch helped catch the killer obsessed with witchcraft and secret codes. A code was left at the scene of crime that required cracking. It was quite amazing. But first, a bank robbery in Manchester that had police baffled. Emergency services were called to a van on fire. A woman was nearby, absolutely hysterical. She worked for the local NatWest Bank. Half a mile away, police were at that bank. A second member of staff was missing and police feared he was being held hostage inside the branch by armed robbers. Oh, police! You in the back! Show yourself! Come out with your hands up! A major incident was in progress. Wilmsville Road was sealed off. The area around the bank was sealed off. Attempts were made to ring into the bank to speak to someone. Uh, there was no answer on any of the phones in there. After two hours, police were no clear as to what was happening inside. Well, we decided that uh, we'd had enough and we, we really did need to take some positive action. Police stormed the bank. Over £200,000 was missing from the vault and the robbers were long gone. Police did find Shazim, the cashier, who was bound and gagged. I was faced with two key witnesses, male and female, both hysterical, both had suffered extreme trauma uh, as a result of this incident. Within hours, the two victims, Angela and Shazim, were interviewed, and police began to piece together the events that morning. Hey, you all right? Yeah, fine. I met a colleague, Shazim, and picked him up, and we drove down to the bank together. So did you sort it out, though? Yeah, it was all right in the end, yeah. Oh, it was good. good. We're having a good night. Yeah. There was a van parked where I normally park. I've got as much room. You just check me going back. Yeah, right, yeah. Keep going. Right. I heard the van door slide open, and I heard somebody jump out. I heard them hit the ground. <laughs> And I remember thinking, if you just wait one minute, I'll get out of your way. And I turned my head to tell him that. And as I looked at him, he had a gun, which he was pointing at me. <laughs> you just stand and, and look, and you, it's, you just, it's quite unbelievable, really, that someone's in the car park with a gun pointing at you. <laughs> I remember looking at Shazim, and he was just stood, he didn't move. He got hold of the top of my left arm and he lifted me with one hand off the ground and put me into the van. He was huge. <laughs> I was so frightened um, because I didn't know what was going to happen.
All I could think about was whether I was ever going to see my children again. Angela was driven to a nearby car park. Stop me! My initial thoughts were that we were dealing with a professional gang of robbers, simply because there was very little in terms of clues left at the scene. Lack of fingerprints, other forensic opportunities, witnesses even. The only clue police did have was the robber's van. The van was burnt out in an effort to destroy all evidence. And yes, it did destroy forensic evidence within the van. What it didn't do is obviously it can't destroy the VIN plate, which has details of the make, the model, and through that we were able to uh, identify the registration of the van. Police traced the van to Liverpool. Only the registered owner had sold it in Auto Trader the day before the robbery. Hello, Prangley Rock from Manchester. I said he was interested in buying the van. I met him at Liverpool Lime Street. Back the man Thomas met that day at the station called himself Haroon Khan. Here we go. The first impressions of him was like he looked totally out of place to buy a van like that. He was dressed totally head to foot in black, like he just stepped out of an office. Overcoat, shiny shoes, gloves. I drove for 395. He knocked me down 50 quid, the cheeky sod. And that was it. So, you know, he was back up to Manchester, didn't he? Thomas gave us a very good description of the person who bought the van. And what's even better, he also explained that he'd met this person at the railway station in Liverpool. Now, from the investigation perspective, this was a massive breakthrough for us, simply because there was every opportunity that we'd captured their meeting on the CCTV. My main job was to compile a plan of all the um, CCTV cameras uh, at this station. After days of searching, there he was. Captured on camera, the man we believed was Harun Khan. It was an amazing moment. I was extremely excited. The whole team was uh, buzzing with uh, excitement. Uh, it was a real turning point for this investigation. On his way to buy the van, Haroon Khan phoned Thomas, saying he was on a train approaching Liverpool station. When CCTV and phone records were cross-checked, they told a different story. Khan was not on a train. He had, in fact, called from a station payphone. Of course, the question that I asked myself was, well, why would somebody like Haroon Khan lie over such a trivial thing? What did he have to hide about this? Was Khan trying to cover his tracks and throw police off the scent? Brian King wasn't fooled. He had a pretty good idea what really happened. Khan didn't get to Liverpool on the train. He got there in a motor vehicle. If police could link Khan to a vehicle, then they would have his address. I took the view that if I was to look at the CCTV on the main routes out of Manchester to Liverpool on the day of the purchase, then if Haroon Khan had used a vehicle, there was every chance that vehicle would have stopped and perhaps filled up with petrol. And if that was the case, that would have been captured on CCTV. If Brian's hunch was to be proved right, detectives would have to trawl through CCTV from every camera at every garage and motorway services on all routes between Manchester and Liverpool. The odds were stacked against them. This took, I think, four or five days, hours, I was going through the tapes. And then, amazingly, um, one afternoon, you know, I seen our man in his sharp suit filling up the car. Then there was a second suspect who was with him who actually went into the service station to pay, who we had good footage of, and we had the registration number of the car. I don't think I believed it at first. I thought, you know, and it must have took 10, 15 minutes of going back, playing the tape again, going back, and I thought, this is our man, we've got him. We checked that number plate and it did not register to a man called Haroon Khan. It was actually registered to a man called Kasim Hasham. 
Qasim Hashem had two sons, Imran Hashem and Munir Hashem. When we looked into Munir and Imran, we made our first match. The man calling himself Harun Khan was, in fact, Imran Hashem. CCTV proved he'd bought the van with his brother, Munir. What I used to say to people, I used to say, look, yes, it's good and it's, it's positive, but it doesn't put him at the robbery. It's as simple as that. It, it's a good line of inquiry, but it didn't put him at the robbery. Police put their two suspects under surveillance. It was to prove extremely useful. Meanwhile, armed with the news of the CCTV breakthrough, Brian made the decision to visit bank staff. With, with hindsight, it was probably the wrong decision to make because shortly afterwards, Imran Hashem had gone to Kenya. Was it a coincidence or was it because he'd been tipped off by somebody? Very few people knew of the existence of the CCTV. So I then began to wonder, is this an inside job and had he been tipped off by somebody from the bank? In an incredible twist to the story, police discovered the unthinkable. Shazim, their victim at the bank, was actually related to their prime suspects, Manir and Imran. He was their brother-in-law. It's a very delicate situation where one of your victims um, is potentially a, a suspect. And you've got to understand how delicate the whole process needs to be managed because if I was to get that wrong and make the wrong decision, then that could be extremely damaging. Certainly on the face of it, Shazim was a model employee. He was fairly quiet. He didn't talk an awful lot. He probably had to draw information from him. But he seemed very pleasant, um, thought a lot of his children. Shazim had been interviewed by police at length and certainly seemed a plausible victim. I was absolutely petrified, I was shocked, and my brain was just thinking about entering at that time and the security and the safety. The investigation was going well until Shazim announced that he too was off to Kenya to recuperate. Had police now lost a second key suspect? It, it was a gamble to let him go. But at that stage, it was appropriate. And it was to perhaps lull um, Shazim into a false sense of security. We had to give the impression that we still believed him to be a victim, uh, that the investigation was still going on. And we still kept him informed, even when he was in Kenya via his, his manager at the bank, how the investigation was going on. But obviously we had to be a bit careful about what we said. Thinking the heat was off, Munir remained in the country. He was being uh, watched very closely by my colleagues. It also became clear as well that he had a new interest, which was uh, shopping. <laughs> The suit you've got on is £350. No problem. Considering he's got no money and he wasn't working, he wasn't doing too bad for himself. Do you like this, Do you need any help? How much is this? That's £600. Mm. OK, I think. Mania had a long shopping list. Two of us. Can I have this one, please? Not one to get the bus, Manir then treated himself to an Audi A3. We discovered it had been purchased on the 20th of December, three days after the bank robbery, for £15,000 cash. Within a few days, that car was then sporting a personalised plate which read Manir. I don't suppose we were too surprised to discover that it had come from the same auto trader that they'd actually used to buy the van from Thomas in Liverpool. Although we had suspects, we didn't have enough to start making arrests. And so we sought the assistance of Crime Watch. In 10, 9. Right, here we go then. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And 1. 
Vigo and Phoenix. Yeah. Hello, and as well as Greater Manchester Detectives, there are officers here from across the UK, as always. The actual night of the Crime Watch programme was significant for a number of reasons. We had Munir in our sights and we knew where he was and what he was actually doing. And significantly, at five to nine, um, five minutes before the broadcast was due to go out, he was seen to go to a friend's house and watch the programme itself. Welcome to the door. No sudden movements. Big news this in, in Russia. I've been in the papers again tonight. Word is on the street this was an inside job. Inside job. Inside job. The second crime watch finished, uh, Munir left the flat and we followed him straight to the bank employee's house, Shazim Jusab. The fact that Munir went to Shazim's house provided the first concrete link between the two men and the robbery. This to us was fantastic. Shazim Jusab's out of the country and Munir had a key to let himself in. Now, we don't really know what was in them carry bags. Uh, I suggest it may have been money from the bank. It may well have been some of Shazim's share of the money from the bank. And it may be that the showing of the programme caused Munir such concern that he went round to the bank employee's house, his brother-in-law, and removed evidence. I became very interested in Munir's friend, the blackmail, the one who I believed he'd watched the Crime Watch programme with. And because of that, I decided to put him under surveillance too. Police secretly filmed him and discovered that he too had recently bought an Audi A3 from a garage in Cheshire. The garage had insisted that he parted with his driving license so they could verify who he was, and they took a photocopy of this. I believe you've got some documentation for us. Yeah, that's right. So we were pleased to find out that the garage still had this photocopy, which showed us a photograph of this individual, and one better than that was, in fact, his name. And that name was Daniel Cordell Stevens. Daniel Cordell Stevens was an interesting character. He had worked with Muneer as a bouncer at various Manchester nightclubs. He achieved moderate success a while back when he penned lyrics to chart topping song All Rise by Blue. His name was run through the police computer. It showed previous for assault. The date for the arrest was set, and that was the 17th of February. And that was two months to the date after the, the actual bank robbery. We had eight premises to search, and we, we, we got warrants for each of those premises. And we used in excess of 150 officers. I took Manier's address. He didn't initially answer the door, so we had to force entry. We found Munir in there, and he was arrested on suspicion of carrying out the bank robbery. We also found within his flat uh, a black suitcase which matched the description that had been used uh, in the robbery. Uh, we found a quantity of cash also in there. Just as police were leaving, the washing machine finished its cycle. Officers checked inside and found a bundle of cash. Muneer's attempt to hide the evidence had failed. As individuals, when we, when we were initially interviewing them, they, I think they were quite confident that we weren't going to put together the evidence for this because they believed that they'd covered uh, all the bases. Daniel Stevens was interviewed at length. For a writer of song lyrics, he was surprisingly short of words. The man who got out of the van. Hey, where you are! Held a gun to the naval of the lady who was kidnapped. Was that you, Danny? Right, right, he binds her hands together, he binds her legs together, and he binds her mouth. Was that you, Danny? <laughs> on the 1st of February, on BBC television, there was a reconstruction of the bank robbery shown on the programme Crime Watch. Were you aware of that? No comment. No comment. No comment. Do, do you wish to make any comments on that? No. 
Police needed to prove that Daniel knew Mania. This photo did the job. Playtime was over. You see this one here, ten Alton Towers showing you and Mania on the Oblivion right. Can you see that? Yep. And who's that on the left? That's me. Yeah, and who's that on the right? Shazim, on the other hand, was happy to comment. He blamed Mania. He was the one who started the discussion. He said, I want to rob in a quest bank, Russia. It came to a point when I said to him, there is no way I'm going to let you rob the bank. He stopped, he told me, listen, you have it my way or the highway. He told me about the crime was program. And he said, on the crime was program, the presenter said that this was an inside job. That's what he told me. So I was absolutely shocked at that. It was all an act. The case went to trial at Manchester Crown Court. Shazim changed his tune and pleaded guilty for his part as the inside man at the bank. He was sentenced to 12 years. The judge called him a born liar. All the colour just went completely out of my face. It's just total disbelief. It's horrible, it's a horrible feeling to think that someone's betrayed you like that. Because you trust people. Manir and Daniel pleaded not guilty, but were found guilty of kidnap and armed robbery. They were given 15 years each. Imran Hasham was tried on his return from Kenya. He got 10 years for conspiracy to commit robbery. There were other players involved, and they were charged with, with money laundering. But the critical issue for me and the inquiry team was to actually identify, arrest and convict the four armed robbers. And we did that. Crime Watch has helped solve nearly 60 murders. Here's one of the most bizarre. case a code was left at the scene of crime that required cracking it was quite amazing we had a mixture of sex violence witchcraft and a victim that apparently didn't know the killer I suddenly realized how sinister things had been in my house 19 years ago, just after midnight, Keith Slater and his wife Carol were asleep in bed. I was asleep when I was suddenly awoken by the sound of three or four loud knocks. Keith went down to open the door. Keith Slater? I was startled and I immediately jumped out of bed. I then heard what I knew was the sound of a person struggling. No words were spoken. As I ran down, I saw that Keith was covered in blood over his left shoulder. I knew he had been stabbed. Thirty-five-year-old Keith Slater lived in Hessel, a small town on the outskirts of Hull. He was a driving instructor and keen rugby player. Teammates said he worked hard and played hard. His death was a total mystery. When I got there, uh, sadly Keith was dead. He was lying in the living room. Uh, and Carol, his wife, was there with Keith in the house, trying to come to terms with what happened. It, it was a, a bloodstained scene. There was blood all over the place. And clearly, Keith had been viciously attacked. A picture emerged of, of the murderer walking through Hessel, looking for Bonacard Road. During that journey, he'd asked a number of people for directions. When he ran away from the scene, he took a strange route as well. These things suggested to me that actually the killer didn't know Hazel that well, and therefore this was someone who'd never been to Keith's house before. I would describe the man as in his mid-twenties, around five foot seven tall, 
he appeared stocky. He had very large, wide eyes which gave him a crazed look. At every crime scene, we conduct house-to-house -house enquiries because we know these will reveal clues to us. In this case, neighbours saw the murderer run away from the scene, so we knew the escape route. We also knew that he'd gone over Ferry Road Bridge. And that's where we found the tissue. On that tissue was Keith Slater's blood. The killer had discarded it as he fled from the scene. But six weeks into the inquiry, Police had no suspects and no idea why Keith was killed. We still hadn't made the link between the killer and Keith. We didn't know whether or not this was a random killing or that Keith was killed because of some other motive. Let's take you back now to the start of the August bank holiday. With so little to go on, Humberside Police made an appeal on Crime Watch. What the Crime Watch programme did was allow us to put some pieces of that puzzle together and all of a sudden a picture appeared. 200 miles away in Wallington, Surrey, a viewer became anxious at hearing Slater's name on Crime Watch. She couldn't wait to tell her son, so Barry. Instructor called Keith Slater. The moment she mentioned Slater, a heavy feeling came in me. And I felt sick. Keith answered a knock on the door of his home and someone stabbed him to death. There was a police station across the road from where I worked, and I walked in there and said I'd like to speak to somebody, read the Crime Watch program and a murder in Hull. A month before the murder, landlord Barry Williams had rented rooms to two brothers, Patrick and Martin Brown. They were really like chalk and cheese. Patrick was very outgoing, vivacious, uh, lively. But Martin was a quieter, uh, calmer person altogether. The brothers had an unusual friend called Joe Henry. He was a frequent visitor to the house and the three would often disappear into the woods. Joe Henry was a very um, forceful character. I was told he was a gypsy. Um, that he had some high rank in, in, in gypsy circles, that he, he knew all about shamanism. He had this world that he lived in, sheer fantasy as far as I, I was concerned. Conversations in the house between the brothers and Joe Henry revolved around one name. The word Slater would crop up. Um, Slater was described as an evil spirit or being. If anything went wrong in my house, something got broken, it was Slater's fault. One night, Patrick Brown turned around very coldly and said, Slater's dead. And I thought, well, thank God for that. That's it, the story's dead. I never for one minute attached that name to a human being. This account from landlord Barry Williams would prove crucial. It provided a link between the three men and Keith Slater. Keith's wife, Carol, had worked in the same old people's home as Joe Henry. They'd had a brief affair. Keith had found out and warned Joe off. This was clearly a significant line of inquiry. Joe Henry and the Brown brothers were all arrested and questioned. Joe and Patrick had cast iron alibis. Martin Brown didn't. He said that he'd gone into London to buy some drugs to send to his brother, that he'd drunk alcohol, become drunk and fallen asleep in a park. He couldn't produce a witness to say where he was or what he was doing. Police were baffled. Joe Henry seemed the obvious suspect because of his affair with Keith's wife, yet he had a watertight alibi. Martin Brown had no alibi, but why would he kill Keith Slater? Then, out of the blue, Martin Brown apparently confessed to his mother that he was the killer. Martin 
Martin's mum was a religious person and this troubled her greatly and she sought advice from, from a priest. Martin's mum explained to the priest how she had confronted her son about the murder of Keith Slater. She wanted answers. Martin had apparently told her that he did it. Police were confident the confession would nail Martin Brown. It didn't. For legal reasons, it couldn't be used as evidence in a court of law. After seven years, all meaningful lines of inquiry had been exhausted and the investigation was scaled down. I was always convinced that one day we would catch this man and bring him to justice. I just knew that if we kept working away, we'd get there. Fifteen years after the murder, the case was reviewed. Detective Sergeant Phil Bell joined Colin and began working his way through all the evidence. Initially, I wasn't aware of how big the task was. I think I read certainly in excess of 2,000 statements that were, uh, that were part of the original inquiry. A fresh pair of eyes spotted a remarkable clue. I was looking through a document folder. Um, I'll never forget the document number. It was document number 141. Uh, and as I opened it up, I saw it was a photocopy of a matchbox that's been found about a mile away from the scene. There were two rows of numbers written on the back of the matchbox. And I remember commenting to a, a girl in the office, I said, um, uh, what's Martin Brown's date of birth? And, uh, and she said, 18th of February 1964. And I said, bloody hell, I've found a matchbox here that's got Martin Brown's date of birth on. The second row of numbers was the date of the murder, the 26th of August, 1988. It also had a number, when I looked on the side, uh, the photocopy, it had a number 32, which was Keith Slater's house number. I thought, this is so important. It's uh, never been brought to anybody's attention before. It was fantastic. It was an absolutely brilliant feeling. To learn more about what these numbers meant, detectives approached Dr Richard Hoskins, an expert in numerology. For a person who's into numerology, it will dictate everything they do. And the most fundamental date in numerology is the birth date of a person that's produced or worked out into a single number. Now, in the case of Martin Brown, his birth date, 18th of February 1964, when you add those digits together, as he had done on the matchbox, it produced 31. Three plus one, four. And he lived his life by that number. That number four indicates a person of great determination, will, who wants to go ahead and do whatever he wants in life. I think he thought he was under some kind of protection from the occult, that he was empowered through the actual writing of it. He'd done it in code. He'd never be busted. He was wrong. This matchbox found near to the murder scene was compelling evidence. But police needed more. It was Joanne Ashworth's job to assess all the original scientific evidence. She focused on the bloodstained tissue discarded by the killer. We could imagine that the offender, as he's running away from the scene, looking around for something to wipe blood from his hands, pulls out a tissue from his pocket, wipes his hands and either drops it or discards it. Straight away, possibilities of DNA from the offender exist. But the forensic team ran into a huge problem. At the original examination, we were told that the tissue was in very bad condition. Obviously, it had been stored over the years and was very, very fragile. There was a real chance the tissue would reveal nothing. We did insist that we had some DNA tests carried out, and the first pass, we had a negative result. The tissue was revisited. Again, more negative results. Again, disappointment. After two years, the forensic team had found nothing. They were close to giving up. But then a scientific breakthrough offered a glimmer of hope. I tested 10 different areas of the toilet tissue using a newer technique, what we call low copy number DNA. If you just touch an, an item, you leave trace amounts of your DNA behind. A low copy number is sensitive enough to pick up that DNA. After a third and final attempt, the team at last had a breakthrough. We achieved a full DNA profile from a male individual who wasn't the deceased. So we thought, good chance that this DNA could be from our offender. 
The profile was entered into the National DNA database, but no match was found. It was now Phil's job to identify who that profile belonged to. It was a priority to compare the DNA sample with that of prime suspect Martin Brown. But obtaining a DNA sample wasn't going to be easy. Brown was now living in Australia. As a consequence of that, I had to approach his family members to try and obtain a paternal or maternal DNA link, which would then prove that the DNA on the tissue was related to the Brown family. His father agreed to provide a sample. This sample from Norman Brown proved the DNA on the tissue was from one of his four sons. Three were quickly eliminated, and that left one, Martin Brown. I would describe a murder inquiry as doing a jigsaw puzzle. What you try and do is establish a picture of what the murder's all about. All of a sudden, you saw a clear picture of what it was, and that picture was Martin Brown. We now knew that we were on the track of the killer. Phil got his number in Australia and gave him a call. Hello. Hello there, is that Martin? It is. Martin, it's DS Phil Bell from, uh, from Humberside. Um, we're reinvestigating the Keith Slater murder. To receive a telephone call, asking him about a murder inquiry from 1988, I'm sure he'd be absolutely flabbergasted. It was something that he would have thought was well in the past. The reason we're reinvestigating the murder is that we have obtained a DNA profile um, which we are trying to find the source. And I've got to ask you whether you uh, consent to provide a DNA sample. I understand uh, your concern with this case for a murder, but yeah. what I be concerned? Well, uh, you, know, yeah, you could do that. I'll think about it. I'll think about it. That's all I can say. Um, and what about coming across to this country to be interviewed about it? I don't think so, mister. OK. If we came across to Australia, would you be amenable to be interviewed across there? Um, I think I'll do the best I can, like... Right, OK. I take it that's a no, then, is it? Well, not just to suit you, bastards, no. After 18 years, it was time for Martin's past to catch up with him. Last October, detectives flew to Australia to arrest him and bring him home. Martin lived in a small village near the mountains in, in southern Australia. Quite an idyllic area to live in. He was obviously married and he had two teenage sons. He worked as a um, part-time TV repairman and uh, part-time electrician. He had a nice, comfortable lifestyle. People believe all sorts of things. What's extraordinary is that in an obsessive type of character, it seems that it can take over a person's life. In Martin Brown's case, it was numerology that just consumed him, took over his whole being. He wanted to live his whole life by it. The murder of another human being happened because he thought he was obeying and following the rules of numerology. Having flown halfway around the world, detectives had caught the killer. When I finally met him in Australia, uh, it was a sense of immense professional pride that finally had, we'd got the man. To look him in the eyes and, and arrest him for the murder of Keith Slater was, uh, was quite a moment, really. And, and as soon as I looked him in the eyes, I knew that it was him. There was no doubt, and he knew that I knew it was him. In court, Martin Brown pleaded not guilty, but the evidence proved otherwise. The judge said the motive for the murder may never be known, and even Brown himself may not have the answer. Martin Brown was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Later tonight, a teenager trapped in a male body. Lucy, the teen transsexual, turns 18 and shares her story with BBC One at 10.40. Ultimate Outdoors. In an epic journey, Griff Rhys Jones climbs the mountains of Britain. Ah, curses! 
the mountain means all things to all men. A brand new series. Well done. Mountain, part of the ultimate outdoor season. Sunday at 9 on BBC One. If all the hype surrounding modern India is to be believed, India's population is surging ahead in an economic revolution that has created a brand new superpower. It's so unbelievably chaotic. I'll be travelling through a country that's very much a part of me, but one that I don't know much about. This is Pakistan. Two independent nations, two very personal journeys. India with Sanjeev Busco starts Monday at 9 on BBC Two. This is BBC One, now the 10 o'clock news with Hugh Edwards.